I'm Paul Brody. <laughs> I know my line by now. <laughs> We're in my shop here, and uh, if I was going to classify myself as something, I'd say I'm a fabricator. I like to make stuff. I started making stuff. I remember I was at, at my grandmother's house, I was probably six or seven, and I made a, a, a wooden box. I got some wood and I, a saw and some nails, and I, I made a wooden box. And then I always had Meccano sets. And then my father had a, a big box of electrical connectors and I took them all apart and he never could figure out how to put them all back together again with all the parts. So I was always using my hands and I started taking a, a piano lessons when I was either four or five. So using my hands was always ingrained and I used to do artwork as well. And then when I was, I was 12 years old, I decided to make a little, a little mini bike. And all the kids in the neighborhood, if you had some money, you had one. Uh, a Bonanza mini bike was $149, and I didn't have $149, and my father wasn't gonna buy me one. Other kids' fathers would, would buy them. So one day I was in school, and I heard about a frame for sale, a mini bike frame, and it was $35, and I think I had $35. So I went and looked at it, and it was a piece of junk. So as I walked home, I decided on that walk home that I was going to make my own, own mini bike. So I started finding parts. It took me a year and it cost me, I think, $110 to build this bike. And then uh, I had that for about a year and then I decided that I was going to sell it and get something else. So I put an ad in the buy and sell and I was picking strawberries that day and a young guy phoned up and my mom showed him the bike and the price was $85 and he asked her if he could make an offer and so she says, well, how much were you thinking? And he says, $84. So she said, okay. So when I got home, the bike was gone and I had $84, which didn't last very long. In my life, I've gone back ever since I was 12, it's been motorcycles or bicycles, and then motorcycles, but it's been back and forth the whole time. I got interested in, in bicycles a lot. I mean, I, I always had a bicycle, but it was a three-speed or something, but then I guess that would have been in, 1970 and that's when the 10 speed craze hit and there was 10 speeds everywhere and it was so cool to have 10 speeds and the dropped handlebars it was there was bicycles everywhere the bicycle stores couldn't keep them in stock and, and there was a local a local motorcycle shop he was selling the bicycles. He had two guys working for him. All they did all day was just assemble bikes out of boxes and they sold as fast as he could assemble them. It was just an amazing time. I became a frame builder. I mean, in high school, I was always, always modifying motorcycle frames. I would, I would cut a section out and extend it and make a different swing arm and doing that, but I, I won't say I was, a, I, I was just kind of a hack back then. And then in my, in my 20s, I got into cab driving because I was playing saxophone. My saxophone teacher was a cab driver and he told me all the benefits of working a few days a week and having four days off and that really appealed to me. So I got into cab driving and then I found it was really hard to leave. But then I got a job finally at a bicycle shop. That was the peddler. I didn't last long at the, at the shop. Uh, actually, I was having a, a really good conversation with the manager. His name was Dave and we talked all about sloping top tubes and, and 24 inch wheels and we talked for like an hour and I went home feeling really good and then I came to work the next day and the owner of the peddler says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here to work. And he says, didn't Dave tell you? I said, tell me what? He says that you're fired. 
And so that was a real kind of a blow, but because I'd never been laid off before. So they needed a spray painter out at Rocky. It was actually called Sherpa Manufacturing. So they asked me if I would paint. And I said, well, I don't know anything about painting. And they said, well, we don't know anybody else. So I had a 64 Ford Econoline van that was all painted up in, in primer. It was named Grandma. So I'd go out to Steveston and I learned, I taught myself how to paint because there was nobody to show me. And then once I was out there and I was in the frame building shop and Derek Bailey was there and mountain bikes had just started selling and I realized there was an opportunity. So I said to Rocky, I said, well, why don't you let me be the frame builder out there for mountain bikes? because Derek Bailey had no interest in mountain bikes and they were really skeptical, like in, in capital letters, really skeptical. But they gave me 10 sets of tubing and set me loose and so I went home and for a week I sat on my couch and I had a, a Ritchie frame because they were selling Ritchie frames and I just, I kept thinking, how would Tom do it? That's what went through my head for a whole week. How would Tom do it? So I made up a jig and made a frame and they were really kind of shocked that I made a frame but that's so that's how it began with Rocky Mountain. I think it was fairly straight it was painted green and it had lugs. I was kind of copying the Richie Annapurnas and I was trying to make my own style but when you're just starting out that's kind of hard and the frame took a long time and Rocky Mountain was saying, when's, when's that frame going to be ready, you know? <laughs> and I'd say, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. So it was, it was a horizontal top tube, and when I look back, it was, it was, it was kind of clunky, but it was a frame. It was a start. So I had some experience, but I had to learn about, about bicycle frames, and it's a whole, whole different level of, uh, of, of craftsmanship, because on it, when someone buys a bicycle frame, they don't want to see any sort of a defect or a fr or a, a braze that's not filed up or something. So I really had to raise my level because when I was making motorcycle stuff, you know, if, if there was a little imperfection, I was okay. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't concern myself with that, but. But the bicycle industry, especially the hand-built, the expensive bikes, they want everything to be perfect. They want the, you know, all the filing to be perfect, the paint to be perfect, all that. So I had to raise my level. So when I got to Rocky there, the first thing that Derek told me was, he says, I'm not going to show you anything. Because it's there's there's sort of a mentality that some people have in shop situations where they don't want to share the knowledge for whatever reason. They think that they might lose their job, the person might take, I don't know what they think, insecurity, whatever. So, so he, he never really mentored me, but I would watch him. So I learned all his good habits and his bad habits as well. So later on I had to unlearn the bad habits. But so we did have some good times. We were both into, into rock trivia and when we played Sea Fox or whatever it was, we would guess who the artist was and things like that. So it was, it was good for a while and then we kind of had a falling out. But Well, I wrote my letter of resignation. Uh, I had a friend from England, he used, to, he used to be a roommate and he always told me how he left this one job. He wrote a letter, he says, with regret, I hereby resign and signed his name. So I always had that in the back of my mind. So I wrote a letter to Rocky, it was Grayson. I said, uh, dear Grayson, with regret, I hereby resign. <laughs> so I kind of copied what my friend did and, and that was okay. I guess they were used to people coming and going and that's when I started Brody Bikes. That was May of 86. It was exciting. It was exciting starting my own business and I got married at the same time. So everything happened in May of 86. Expo started as well. So there's a lot going on. I had a salesman. That's kind of how I, and I decided to leave Rocky because he was a 
salesperson at Rocky and for some reason he stopped by my place and I showed him because I've been making uh, uh, jigs and fixtures for a whole year at that point in planning to leave. When I, when I decided to leave Rocky, that was in 85, and I thought that I could make all my jigs and set up in four months and it would cost me $4,000. Well, it took a year and it cost $8,000 to get set up. So, and he shows up and he says, well, I'll be your salesperson and uh, you know, we can, we can make this work. So that's when I decided to leave Rocky because he was going to leave Rocky at the same time. So the shops weren't ordering frames, but all these racers were wanting frames. And because, you know, I was I was mountain bike racing at the time. And so they were wanting frames, but he wouldn't sell the races frames, which. So anyway, we had a falling out and I started selling races frames. And that's kind of how it started. It started with the racing community supporting me by wanting these frames with the sloping top tube because that was kind of new at the time. After I worked at Rocky, I built, I built 10 frames and I decided that in my mind, I was a frame builder now. I mean, I was, I was young and I was naive. And so I thought I'd borrow my sister's motorcycle and I'd go to California and I would meet other frame builders down there. So that's what I did. I went down there and I met Tom Ritchie and Joe Breeze and Charlie Cunningham and and Steve Potts. So that was pretty neat to see all the, all the, I mean each of them was so different but it was neat to be down there and, and talk with them and just get a sense of what was going on down there. Back in those days it was that area of the seat tube top tube and the seat stays. What, what you did there kind of set your frame apart from other frame builders. I was always looking for the little details, how to make the frame a little nicer. So I guess that's some of the things which set our frames apart. And then we also did a lot of custom, custom painting. We did splatters and urban camo. And I think the peak of hand-built frames, I guess you could sort of look at it as when the sales were really good, and that was probably in the late 80s. And I made the mistake, and I think a lot of other people made the mistake too, because sales were going up like that. They were just, every year, up like that. And I thought, and I think a lot of other people thought that it would just never end. But I should have looked at my history lesson. I should have looked at other companies that started out and they start out and they accelerate in sales and then there's a, a, a leveling off and then there's usually a bit of decline. So I moved into a huge shop right, right before the peak. I knew, I knew things were changing, but I didn't know what. And then as soon as we moved shop, that was a huge job, then I had to lay off four people. So it's not, a, not an easy time. Well, I sold, I sold half my name, which sounds strange. There was a company, Cybersport, that was interested in buying the name. So first I sold 50% and his lawyer said, don't go for 50%, go for 51. And my lawyer said, don't go for 50 for 51 but obviously you can't have 51 and 51 it doesn't work so we went for 50 50 and and that worked for a while and i i got i got royalties off the bikes that were made in taiwan and some people said that i sold out but i saw it as the evolution because hand-built sales it just got it, it got tougher and i looked around and a lot of the hand-built builders in the u.s they were having trouble too so i knew it wasn't just our company. So I sold, uh, I think in 97, 96, I sold half the name and then four years later in 2001 I sold the next half of the name and then I got into building antique motorcycles and I was building the Excelsiors like, like up here and so that really kind of took over my life for 
quite a lot of years. Harry High Pipes. Um, I was building Excelsiors and I decided that I wanted one for me and I like eight so I chose the number eight because I, I plan on building a total of ten and I was only up to number six but I skipped a number this is number eight I made this bike for me and then I heard about a race down in Florida it's called Sons of Speed where they race these old old, old board track bikes so we got the bike set up, we put oil gas in, got it warmed up, I got into my leathers, I had my helmet, my back protector, I had everything. And then I got a, a push start because there's no, there's no electric start, no kick start. And I did one lap on the very base of the oval, so I'm going slow and then I come around and I'm on the straightaway, turn the throttle and it wouldn't turn back. So the throttle was stuck at the end of the straightaway and I'm going into the corner on a bike I'm unfamiliar with, on a track I'm unfamiliar with. So you only got a, a second or two to make a decision. And so it was, it was either hit the wall or fall off the bike. So I decided in that instant that I'd fall off the bike. So I just started leaning and I'm on my back and I'm sliding feet first in in my leathers and I look over and my bike is on its side and it's passing me and then I don't remember and then I woke up again and I had people standing over me and they're asking me those same questions what's your name what year it is who's the president don't like that last one because it was Trump right I can't feel any pain but I look down and I see my legs and I can see the bones sticking out right here, but there's no pain. They flew me to hospital and I got operated on my leg, my wrist. They didn't fix my thumb. And nine days in hospital there, nine days in hospital here, and then seven months on, on crutches. So that's why I'm not going to be a racer anymore, but I still like race bikes. So that's kind of the story of Harry High Pipes and you can see the dent. So something happened and the bike flipped over 180, no 360 somehow. And so that's called patina. That's staying in there because I, I put a photo on Facebook and I said, you know, do you think I should fix this? No, 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 no. There was a real cry. No, no, don't, don't, don't touch that. That's part of the history. So. Frame Building 101 ran for nine and a half years and I did 65 classes. Never missed a day, kind of proud of that. And uh, probably, I don't know how many students went through there, maybe like 160 or something like that. And, and they all built a frame. I got a new boss, my, my old boss that I, I, I got along with really well. He was leaving, he was going on a sabbatical. He was almost at, at his age of leaving. And uh, so I got his, his boss and he came in and we had a meeting and the price then was basically $3,000 for a course. And he says, and he, he had a piece of paper and he was making numbers and he didn't have a calculator and he was talking numbers. And he says, you know, you know, we're not making money, so we're going to have to raise it to $5,000. And I'm going, $5,000? That's like 66% raise. And he says, and I said, well, do you think people will sign up? And he says, well, you're Paul Brody, so they're going to come. So that was for in 2020 in the class. The first class after that decision was March 16th. I, I still know the date and nobody signed up. And I was really upset because I really felt like I was losing my class because that became kind of a large part of my identity in a way, you know. And then, and then COVID hit and then every instructor was going under, was under some kind of a change or online. So then I didn't feel so bad. I do like teaching. I feel like I have a knack for it, but at the same time, you know, things at the university have, have, have kind of changed a bit and uh, I feel like I've moved on to YouTube. I'm not, I'm not doing one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm certainly reaching a larger audience. So that's, that's kind of satisfying and it's good to get the comments, you know. 
I procrastinated on my project for five years and now after watching your video I'm back on it thank you and that, so it, you know that really kind of inspires us to keep going because I think that people I know some people get a lot out of it so that that does feel good